As you know, for the past several weeks, we have been looking at the gifts, the spiritual gifts, which God has given to us today. There were seven temporary gifts, and we have already looked at those. Those were the sign gifts, which, as uh, many in the charismatic movement today think, are still here. But those gifts God is no longer giving. So every one of them that you see apparently manifesting in the world today is from a different source than from the Holy Spirit. Those include the gifts of apostle, prophets, healings, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and the gift of knowledge. Seven gifts that related to the reception and proclamation of new special revelation. Things that God had not revealed in the Old Testament, but now has revealed unto his apostles and prophets by the Spirit, as the Apostle Paul explains to us in the book of Ephesians. And then there are additional 15 service gifts, and we have looked at 10 of those. The gift of evangelist, pastor teacher, teacher, governments, ruling, helps, faith, wisdom, self-control, and discerning of spirits. And last week we began part one of two parts dealing with the spiritual gift of giving. But before we look at those, let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the privilege of being your children, those who have been saved, those to whom you have given your indwelling Holy Spirit, those who, through your Spirit, you have gifted that we might serve one another, that we might, as members of the body of Christ, build up the body of Christ, edify each other, and thus have a corporate as well as individual testimony in the world around us. We pray, Father, for your blessings upon your word as it goes forth today, that it would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. This is your word, and we pray for your blessings upon it, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as you know, we read a passage out of the book of Exodus whereby God calls and empowers Moses to go and speak unto Pharaoh. In the same way, if you are a believer, God has called you and he has empowered you to go and speak unto the Pharaohs of this world. You are 
his witnesses. Jesus said so. You are my witnesses. And we are to be witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the earth. And each one of us has an opportunity to participate individually in a personal witness to those around us and also to participate in the corporate witness of this body, this group of believers, this local church, as the gospel of Christ goes forth from here through many different means. And so giving is one of the very key elements of that outreach through the local church. You remember we gave you the definition of giving last week. There are three basic elements after we see the initial definition, but three elements where the gift of giving is applied. Let me give you that definition again. The gift of giving enables every believer. Now let me just stop there for a second. You have the gift of giving. It's not a question mark because the scripture says you have it. It is a And then he commands you to exercise it in the way in which he has ordained. And there are specific ways, the New Testament tells us, in which the gift of giving is to be exercised. We'll begin looking at those this week. It enables every believer to provide money and genuine need-based, not extraneous, not foolish, not... Uh, just things that people are greedy for, provide need-based material goods to needy believers. And God tells us how it's to be done. Cheerfully, generously, freely, and in simplicity. Those four descriptive terms are used of the gift of giving in the New Testament. The gift of giving is to be exercised cheerfully, generously, freely, and in simplicity. And we'll talk about what those words mean a little bit later, the Lord willing. Now here are the three basic areas in which the gift of giving is to be exercised. Number one, to support the corporate ministry and outreach of the local church with which the believer is a functioning part. In other words, if you are a functioning part of this church, whether or not you are a, quote, member or not, but if you are a functioning part of this church, your giving is, first of all, to be directed here, not someplace else. We gave the illustration last week that if you buy your hamburgers at Burger King, you don't go down the street and pay at McDonald's. This is the place where God has called you to be a part, a functioning part, and therefore your first line of giving should come to and through this local church. Number two, to support the pastor or the evangelist of the church and we'll be looking at that more in detail today and number three to support sister churches undergoing persecution and or severe need as the churches of Macedonia did with their mother church the church at Jerusalem and we'll talk about that a little bit later on now we talked about that last time and we noted the differences the distinctions between giving and tithing and when people ask the question should I tithe on the grocer on the net, they are approaching it in the wrong way. What do you want God to bless? The grocer the net. That is really the wrong question because it focuses on limiting our giving to God. And New Testament giving is not a matter of limiting, but a matter of determining what is the maximum that I could possibly give and then giving it cheerfully, generously, freely, and in simplicity. We saw that tithing was a mandatory percentage under the law, but giving is not a mandatory percentage. And if you want to work on percentages, we noted the passages in the Old Testament that showed that the average tithing in the Old Testament was 20%. 10% the first year, 20% the second year, 30% the third year, then back to 10%. That average is 20% over a period of three years. So if you really want to be back under the law, that would be your minimum, 20%. Certainly, giving out of love would go farther than that. 
We noted also that as you looked at the law of the offerings in the Old Testament, the offerings were in addition to the tithe. There were all kinds of different offerings that were given, and some of them were a tax, and some of them were a penalty for different sins that were committed. And there were various gradations of the offerings, all the way from flower offerings, meal offerings they're called, all the way up to have to offering a bullock. That would be like offering a brand new car to the Lord. Uh, depending on the level of the sin that you had committed and you were trying to give a sin offering to make atonement for that. It was a very expensive system. Minimum 25, perhaps 30% for some people who didn't keep their act together or more. A very expensive system to be under. And it was a matter of requirement. It was not a matter of a generous heart. The only thing that is of the generous heart listed in the Old Testament under offerings is the free will offering or the voluntary offering which was above and beyond all of the rest of these things when a man was delighted in the Lord he could bring this voluntary offering to the Lord it's mentioned six times in the Old Testament but rather than having an entitlement mentality of we own so much and we only give God as little as we can we saw that there were four basic principles that would motivate us, if we are truly saved, to want to give above and beyond that which was required by the law. Number one, we are douloi, we are bond slaves of Jesus Christ. A slave owns nothing. The slave and 100% of what the slave owns belong to his master. Second, we are stewards of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not merely bond slaves, but we are stewards, bond slaves who serve as those who are responsible for the management of their master's goods. What we have does not belong to us, but we are stewards of it. We are not owners. We are those who must spend the master's resources in the manner in which the master has commanded his resources to be used. The third thing we need to remember, which we saw last week, is that everything we have has come directly from his hand. It didn't become because we were worthy or we deserved it or that we were talented or we came from a rich family or whatever reason. It came to us from God, even though it came by different means. He is the one who put us in the circumstances of life in which we currently find ourselves. You are not born a poor beggar in India. You are not born as a, uh, some kind of a, a person in a Muslim land. You are not born in an atheist household off in uh, far Russia somewhere, you were born here in America and you have received some benefits that other people perhaps in the rest of the world have not received. It came to you from God himself. And someday, as we have seen in the parable in Luke, we will have to give an account to the master as to whether or not we have obeyed him and obeyed his rules concerning our money and our material possessions. Two verses you recall from Deuteronomy. If thou shalt say in thine heart, my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth, remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, that he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. Those who have obeyed him and those who are in the line of those who have obeyed him have experienced his blessing, and our country certainly has experienced that. But God provides for us our material wealth so that we will remember his covenant to us, his blessings, his promises. Instead of turning our backs on him and deciding to use our money the way we want to use it, we should use it to honor him. For he is the one who has provided it. The Apostle Paul wrote, Let a man so account of us as ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. He reminds us that what we have, even though it may be different than what someone else has, is because God is the one who put us that way. For who maketh thee to differ from another? Or what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, 
Why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? There is no room for arrogance and pride if you are wealthy. There are many in the world who have a lot of money and it makes them very arrogant and they think they are better than other people. Paul says, why do you glory? Why are you proud? Why are you boastful about what you have as though you didn't receive it? Because everything you have has been a gift from God's hand. And then finally, we saw that failure to use money and material resources in the way that God has commanded is the heart of covetousness, which is idolatry. God says so in Ephesians 5.5 5 and Colossians 3.5. Giving is not the same thing as the offerings of the law. We talked about that. And then giving most closely parallels the free will offerings. So what we ended with were some teasers for you last week. Approximately 500 verses in the Bible speak about faith. Approximately 500 speak about prayer. But more than 2,000 verses in the Bible deal with a believer's attitude toward money and wealth management. One out of every four verses in the Synoptic Gospels refers to wise money management. And 12 of the 36 parables, that's one in three, teaches a proper attitude toward material wealth. And so today, we move on to the second part of the gift of giving. And we move over to Romans chapter 12, verse 8, where it is listed among the spiritual gifts. Romans chapter 12, verse 8 tells us, He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. Very straightforward, it seems to us, uh, very easy to obey, but it's rather interesting to know what the word simplicity is. It's the word haplotes, from which we get our English word duplicitous. Duplicitous. Someone who is duplicitous has ulterior motives. The Greek means literally without folds doubled over in the cloth. A man who would come to slay Caesar, for example, would not walk into the Senate with his sword held high above his head like this. He would, as you know from the murder of Julius Caesar, have his dagger hidden under the folds of his cloak. That is what giving is not supposed to be like. Let it be with simplicity. Let it don't be with the double folds in the cloth. No ulterior motives hold it held in the folds of the cloth. We find that there's an illustration of this given to us in the New Testament in the book of Acts. I think you have heard of Ananias and Sapphira. They failed that test for giving. And what did it cost them? It cost them their lives. They had ulterior motives in their giving, and it cost them their lives. Be careful of three things in your giving. Number one, be careful of pretending to give what you have not given. Here, they would have claimed that they had given 100%, but they didn't give 100% to match their claim. God called that lying to the Holy Ghost. Number two, be careful that you don't have a hidden agenda or ulterior motives in your giving. I have known some who have given and made it known so that they might get a position in church leadership. Others so that they might get business because they were in a particular business that many in the congregation might want to use. And believe me, folks, especially in large churches where there are lots of businessmen, there are many there who are there to make contacts for their businesses. If your giving is based on those kind of agendas or ulterior motives, you're in trouble. Number three, third warning, be careful that your giving is not so that you can get glory for yourself through your giving. Giving is an act of worship, and the glory belongs to God. It does not belong to the individual. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 is the second verse that I would like for us to consider today. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God 
loveth a cheerful giver. Rather interesting, the word cheerful there is the word from which we get our English word hilarious. It's not just sort of a mildly amused smile on the face. It is a heart that is filled with laughter and joy and exuberance. It's extravagant giving, hilarious giving. A man who can't wait to give. He loves his Lord so much. Those of you who are young men who are married, or older men now, who were married at one time, stop and think for a moment. Back in the days when you were courting, and you were coming up to that big moment whereby you were about to give an engagement ring to that beautiful young lady whom you were courting. Did you just sort of like set it there next to the sink, you brushed your teeth, combed your hair, you forgot about it for the day, you just sort of left it there. What about your business? You know, I didn't think much about what was going on that evening. That evening you realized, oh yeah, I'm supposed to go see my sweetheart tonight. You got in your car, drove off, and left the ring sitting there on the sink. <laughs> I don't think there's anybody that absent-minded. Certainly nobody who loves the girl that he's about to ask to marry him who would be that careless with the ring. It's a moment of excitement. It's a moment of joy. He thinks about it all day long. It bubbles up inside of his heart. He holds onto that ring. He looks at it. He flashes it in the light, makes sure it's really real, you know, that they didn't give him the wrong ring. You know, wants to make sure there are no inclusions in it, no little, little tiny specks inside. It's a perfect diamond. He looks forward with eagerness. He dresses himself carefully, very, very nicely. He knows that tonight is the big night. And he takes that ring. And he drives carefully, a little bit absent-mindedly, but he, he wants to get there. He's sweating a little bit. He walks up to the door. He knocks on the door. She comes, and she's as beautiful as ever. He takes her out to dinner, and then over candlelight, he reaches out to take her hand, and perhaps unsuspectingly, she reaches out, and as he takes her hand, he slips the ring on. And he says, sweetheart, will you marry me? He is full of joy. He's giving something expensive. He's giving something incredibly valuable. He is offering to her his life and everything that he will ever own. Dear friends, is that the way you give? What kind of a giver does God love? God loves a hilarious giver, an extravagant giver, a giver who pours out his heart in love to the God who has given him everything. That, dear friends, is New Testament giving. That's not the painful giving of the law. That's not the painful counting out of the nickels and every tenth nickel goes to God and you win as you see the pile growing over there. Giving. Giving out of love. That verse tells us something else. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart. This is something that is premeditated. I've been in many places where suddenly they took an offering and there was no premeditation to do it all. And, you know, I hadn't prepared for it. I didn't even have anything in my wallet. And the embarrassment of watching the plate go by. As he purposeth in his heart. God has established certain rules for giving, and we'll talk about those in just a moment, so that a man can purpose in his heart what he will give, so that he can wisely give, so that he can cheerfully and generously and freely and in simplicity give without ulterior motives. The next thing it says in that verse, it tells us that as we give, we're not to give grudgingly. That's the idea of giving, but you wish you didn't have to, but you know you're obligated to. Giving should not be done grudgingly. It does absolutely no good to give grudgingly, because if you give grudgingly, you will not be blessed for that. You've just used up some of your money. Now, God may turn and use it in some way that pleases him, but you are not the one who will receive the blessing from it. 
God can take even the worst situations and use them for his glory. We see that with the cross, and we'll be celebrating that shortly. The, the mo moment, the point of the greatest hatred of man on earth, all of his sin and viciousness poured out against Christ, all of it borne by Christ. The moment of greatest hatred is God's moment of greatest giving and love. So it's not a matter of what God will do with it in the end, and thus it's an excuse. But you will not be blessed if you give grudgingly. Or of necessity. Paul is taking us back to the law. He's reminding us that our giving is not a matter of necessity. Our giving is not a matter of what was required under the law. Our giving is a matter of grace and of love. For God loves a cheerful giver. An illustration of that is the way the churches of Macedonia gave to the persecuted church in Jerusalem. We mentioned it in passing, but Paul says so in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. You say, wow, God bestowed his grace on the churches of Macedonia, so they must have been really rich churches. God gave his grace to the churches of Macedonia, so they had so much, they didn't know what to do with it, and they thought, where can we help out? Oh, I guess they got some problems at Jerusalem. Listen to the grace of God. Here's what the grace of God was. How that, in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, these are going to be hilarious givers. They are giving out of an abundance of joy, not an abundance of money. They are giving out of an abundance of joy. And they are giving in the middle of a great trial of their own afflictions. They were suffering persecution. But you say, well, they still might have had a nest egg hidden under the mattress. They were going through some persecutions, but they had, they had packed it away. They'd, they'd got their little savings, uh, you know, put away safely in a, a bank in, a, in Switzerland. And so even though they were going through affliction, they didn't have to worry too much. No, that's not the case. They had affliction, but they were filled with joy. And the next phrase, and their deep poverty. Here was a church that was going to give intensely and generously to meet some needs in Jerusalem. They were undergoing persecution. Most of us would try to pull everything in at that moment. But you see, they had such joy in their hearts for the salvation that they knew they had in Christ and for the fact that the church at Jerusalem was the one who had sent the missionaries to them and now that church had a need. They were really poor. They said, you know, not sure we're going to be able to make it through next week. We're really poor. But it said, it abounded, their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. The riches of their generosity. For to their power I bear record. Paul bears record himself. Yea, and beyond their power... It wasn't just as much as they thought they could give. It was more than they thought they could give. Beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty. Paul did not have to twist their arm. They begged Paul to take the offering to Jerusalem, bearing, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Do you understand what that says? They didn't just love themselves. They didn't even just love their local church. They loved other believers. Some of them had never even met. But they were, knew they were true believers. They knew they had a genuine need. And they said, after we consider what God has done for us, how can we withhold the need of these other Christians? God will meet our needs. Let's take and give as much as we can and beyond what we can so that we can help them. Folks, is that the way you give? Is that the kind of love that motivates your giving? 
praying us that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship. You see, this develops a bond of fellowship, of the ministering. Here it is a service to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves unto the Lord. They went back and said, you know, really the bottom line in all of this is we belong to Christ. Lord, we are giving ourselves once again. It's like a rededication, a recommitment. You ever heard about that? You say, you know, I, I haven't done everything I should have for the Lord. I haven't, I haven't given the way I should have. I haven't served the way I should have. I haven't witnessed the way I should have. Lord, I've sinned. I'm rededicating my life. I want you to take full control of it now. And every focus of my life, I want it to focus on Jesus Christ and serving him. Because someday as a steward, I will stand in his presence and give an account for what I have done with my stewardship. That's a powerful passage, folks. They first gave their own selves and unto us by the will of God. Let me summarize that. Don't look for ways to reduce your giving. Look for ways to increase your giving. Let me notice some other things about the New Testament gift of giving. Why do we take our offerings on Sunday? Well, that's what we see in Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, not suggestion, order, even so do ye. So this was not just a principle related to Corinth only, but it was related to all these churches that Paul had ministered. Verse 2. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. Here we find the Apostle Paul setting some safeguards. He tells us the giving is supposed to be on the first day of the week. We don't want to, if I show up on Tuesday, we want to have a special offering taken on Tuesday. He says, it should be systematic, it should be weekly, it should be on the first day of the week, and it should be thought through, laid by him in store, not based on the tithe, but based on how God has prospered him. Some may be prospered greatly, some may be prospered only a little. You lay by you in store as God has prospered you so that there will not be all these special offerings. The church today duns people for money every time we walk through the doors. But the New Testament church, it was the first day of the week only, so that there would not be special offerings. Then will I send to bring your liberality to Jerusalem. Notice Paul is putting in a protection here. He's not going to carry it by himself. Those who are accountable, who are known by the church, will be the ones who accompany Paul to bring that offering to Jerusalem. There is accountability in the use of the funds and the offerings which God's people have brought for specific purpose. Notice something. Those are the five elements in corporate context. Now there's individual giving outside of corporate giving, but in the corporate context, first day of the week, number two, it's pre-planned and systematic giving. Number three, it applies to every believer. Let every one of you says the Apostle Paul. He doesn't make any exceptions. It is every believer, and so if you are not giving money, the collection stated in verse 1, to and through the church, and for the work of the church, let me be very blunt. If you are not giving money to and through the church, for the work of the church, you are in specific rebellion and sin to the command of God's word. There are many people who say, well, I can give other things. I can give this way or that way or the other thing. I'll give the church my used stuff. I'll give the church my junk. Back in the Old Testament, God didn't appreciate that, and neither did he in the New Testament. You know, when Malachi wrote, he says, you know, do you understand this? If you bring you some lamb or some sheep that's got scabs and scurvy and broken legs and so on, you know, if you tried to bring that to your prince, do you think he would accept it? Well, if you do that and... A human won't accept it. Why do you think you can give God your junk? 
Too many people want to give God their junk and then take a tax receipt for it. Please, folks, God deserves our best. Number four, it's based not on the tithe principle, but on how God has prospered. Let me give you an illustration. Some of you may have heard, especially those of you who are a little bit older, of a man by the name of R.G. Letourneau. Letourneau College in Texas is named after him. R.G. Letourneau was the founder of Caterpillar Industries. Those are the ones that make the gigantic earth-moving equipment. Monster, monster machines. Huge machines. R.G. Letourneau worked on the basis of 10% and 90%, except he kept 10% for himself and gave 90% to God. Have you ever thought about that? On the basis of how God has prospered. Begin to revise your thinking so that you think New Testament giving instead of Old Testament minimal tithe. Giving joyfully, giving extravagantly, giving in a way that says, I think the things of this world don't belong to me. The things of this world belong to God and I'm supposed to use them the way he wants me to use them. The things that I want, the things that I'm focused on, are the rewards in heaven. We'll all be there soon enough. I know our, our old flesh resists that thought, doesn't it? We resist that because for years we've held to the other. Dear folks, what does the scripture say? Is there a living God? Are we stewards of his? Does what we own belong to him? Will we someday have to give an account for it? If every believer in the United States of America and around the world functioned on the basis of these giving principles, there would not be any believers in the world who lacked, and there would be no lack of funds for the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, well, one or two people doesn't matter. Well, but what if the one or two becomes three or four, or three or four thousand, or three or four million, or three or four hundred million, or three or four billion people? that aren't functioning like God wants them to function over the course of church history. Giving. All right, there are some additional principles related to giving to needy Christians, which we'll discuss briefly in a few moments, the Lord willing. But the second major area of corporate giving relates to the question, why do we pay our pastor? Paul explains it in Galatians chapter 6 and several other places that we'll look at. Galatians 6, verses 6 and following. Let him that is taught in the word, you're receiving teaching from the word, communicate, that word lit literally means share with. Let him that is taught in the word communicate or share with him that teacheth in all good things. Not in what's left over, but in all good things. Now, I want you to notice something. I've just read the first verse here. This command concerning supporting those who are teaching the word immediately precedes that passage we all know so well as the law of the harvest. Listen in verse 7 and following. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. If you don't do it, you're mocking God. If you don't obey that command in verse 6, you're mocking God. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. Say, man, that's really hard to keep up with that. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. The specific illustration that Paul gives when he explains the law of harvest, what you sow you reap, is the illustration of providing for the pastor. Remember that context. Paul explains the principle in even more graphic terms in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 14. 
Or I only and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? That is, we ought to be able to go ahead and minister without having to work outside. Who goeth a warfare at any time at his own charges? Can you imagine a soldier volunteering to go to Afghanistan and saying, pay, I'll pay my own way? Who goes a warfare at any time of his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not the fruit thereof? He plants it, works hard in this thing, grows all those grapes, walks away and lets somebody else pick them and sell them. Who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man? Paul says, you know, somebody's going to accuse me of just being carnal about this. They're going to say, well, Paul, it's just because you want to get paid. Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? Here's a principle, goes all the way back to the Old Testament, and it is expanded in the New Testament. For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? In other words, was the only reason God wrote that was because he was an animal rights lover. Verse 10, Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth should thresh in hope, and should be a partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, Paul's talking about what he has done for the Corinthians, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing, is it a big deal, if we shall reap your carnal things? What Paul is saying is that spiritual service is exceedingly more valuable than temporal service, than what you pay for cutting the grass, or what you pay for repairing the roof, or what you pay for your utilities, and all the other things that the church pays for. Verse 12, if others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? In other words, you've had others that you are supporting, others that you have paid for this type of service, for example, guest speakers. Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Paul says, I'm willing to give up my rights, because I don't want to, to push my rights and thus put a stumbling block for some, someone and hinder the gospel of Christ. He didn't insist on his rights. He wanted people to understand true value. He taught them the truth about supporting pastors and evangelists without being embarrassed about it and without having to insist on his own rights. Verse 13. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? You know, in the Old Testament, the priests and the Levites not only received the very best portion of certain ones of the offerings that were brought for sacrifice, but they also received a special Levitical tithe. That is, they received from all of Israel, corporately, as a group of priests and Levites, they received 10% every month over 12 months, which was equal to 120% over the course of a year. In other words, under the law, the priests and Levites received a salary of 20% greater than the salary of the average Israelite. Plus, they additionally received the very best parts of each of the specified offerings. Paul goes on in verse 14 and gives us an application. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. In other words, he's making it clear that a pastor should receive a genuine living wage so that he can most effectively serve the church without having to scrape and struggle with secular or other employment to survive and meet the needs of his family. Now please remember and please note, many pastors cheerfully do with less and often work secular jobs because, and I've done that myself, because God has called them to preach whether or not the church provides for them as it should. Please note also that this support is not optional. Even so hath the Lord ordained. That's a command. So, okay, I can see our time is up, and we're about to move into the Lord's table. Um, did you know the New Testament tells you the percentage that you're supposed to give the pastor? <laughs> 
and totally different from what you find in the Old Testament. But you're going to have to wait for that for next week. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the privilege of studying your word. Sometimes it's shocking to us. Sometimes it points to areas of sin in our lives that perhaps we didn't even realize were there because we, we were confused or had not really studied your word as we should. But Father, we've been talking about giving. And what a wonderful subject as we consider the Lord's table. For here we also see giving at its greatest extent. Giving with the greatest amount of love. Giving the most generous gift ever given. Giving sacrificially. Giving joyfully and freely. Giving based on love. The giving of your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who died in our place, who was buried, and who rose again. Father, as we consider your gift to us, does it not move our hearts to want to give to you in love? Oh, Father, as we come to your table, we pray that you will cause us to come with clean hands and a pure heart. We pray, Father, that if there is sin in our lives that needs to be confessed as sin, right now your Holy Spirit will convict us of sin. Right now your Holy Spirit will motivate us to confess that sin and to repent of it. The Father, you would cleanse us, for your word says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Father, in the quietness of this moment, we confess our sins to you and thank you for the gracious cleansing that comes through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.